You are on the screen. We are on the screen and we are off to a good ride. Bonjour. I am Marie-Monique Stacco and I'm the president of the French Institute Alliance Francaise. And it is a pleasure to have so many Zoom and Facebook people joining us today to hear your talk, Gérard Arrault, on geopolitical perspective of the COVID-19 pandemic. We are happy to offer this exciting presentation and programming to all our members and friends in these very difficult circumstances. Tonight, I'm particularly delighted to welcome a longtime friend, Ambassador Gérard Haro. Gérard has been a true French diplomat for many years. Among others, he has been an ambassador to Israel, and most recently, he has been the ambassador to the United States, ambassador, French ambassador to the United States from 2014 to 2019. And he has just published a very excellent memoir, 40 Years of Diplomacy. Gérard has a deep expertise on the world order, and he is an eminent geopolitical specialist. I must say we are absolutely thrilled that he has agreed to share with us uh, his insight and help us understanding the multi-layered complexities of the crisis that we are facing today. And I can't thank you enough, Gérard. It's really a pleasure. Now, I must tell you some uh, housekeeping. He will answer some questions at the end of the presentation. And you should not hesitate to send them on the, apparently you have a Q&A feature on Zoom. So somebody will look at them and we will have an interactive Zoom when you do so. And I would like also that you tell us all where you're from, so that we have an idea of who has been absolutely uh, part of our presentation. And lastly, but very important, if you really enjoy FIAF's program, I encourage you to please uh, consider a donation so that we can continue amuse you, to amuse you, and to, uh, to boost your morale at home. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marie-Monique. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be with all of you uh, in this, as you said, in these very particular circumstances. If I were uh, really honest, I think I should uh, immediately end our conversation here uh, because uh, I think it's totally impossible uh, to make a, a credible forecast of what is going to happen in the world because of the virus. There are so many uncertainties. That I'm, uh, I am myself surprised that so many commentators are announcing what will be the future. Uncertainties first about the virus, Nobody knows whether uh, we are going to find an antiviral in three months or a vaccine in one year. Uh, nobody knows whether there will be a new outburst of the virus in the fall, as it is uh, uh, actually apparently likely. Nobody knows what will be the reaction of the public opinion when reopening the economy, uh, there will be in, in a, an unavoidable manner, uh, there will be a new uh, upsurge of the virus. And in a sense, more importantly, in terms of the economy, we know that we are going to face a recession, but nobody knows what will be this recession, how serious it will be, and how long it will last. And third point about the uncertainties of our times 
it, it is the fact that this crisis has not hit, I should say, a healthy body. Uh, what the, the societies, the Western societies, have already suffered a major trauma with the 2008 economic crisis. And it's not by chance that actually we have been facing in most of the European and American societies, we have been facing uh, uh, the, what we call uh, the populist uh, uh, rage. Our societies are already fragile. Our societies are already traumatized. And it's on these societies that uh, the virus is uh, uh, inflicting a major, a major shock. And when you talk about forecasting, there is something central, which is that you never forecast uh, uh, the breakup. In you know, other ways, you, never, you are never forecasting the revolution. The revolutions are always a surprise for everybody. So I don't want to over-dramatize, but I think that in our fragile societies, this major uh, shock, uh, there could be uh, an unexpected, uh, very unexpected, uh, major and dramatic uh, outcome. Let's think, for instance, of Italy. Italy, its GDP has been stagnating or quasi-stagnating for one decade. Uh, the far right has been knocking at the door for some time. And now Italy has been, in a sense, the, the first victim uh, of, of the virus. And the Italians have concluded, rightly or wrongly, it doesn't matter, but a lot of Italians have concluded that actually the Europeans have more or less let them down, that the European Union has not been uh, uh, has not shown any solidarity. So what is going to happen in Italy? Uh, what will be the reaction of the public opinion, the Italian public opinion, which is submitted uh, actually to such a, uh, to such a trauma, long-term and, and short-term uh, short trauma? I think put on the table all these caveats about the uncertainties, about the unknowns, uh, let's look at geopolitics. Why a geopolitical situation may be changed? I think there are two ways to change a geopolitical situation. The first one is when the balance of power between the main actors, the balance of power is of course the basis of, of uh, geopolitics, if the balance of power between, between ma the main actors is changed in a significant way. That's the first, uh, uh, first way of transforming uh, the geopolitical uh, reality. The second one is if one main actor or several main actors are changing their politics, are, are, following, are following a new policy. So I, I think in the, the, the 10 or 15 minutes we have, I'm going to follow these two questions. First, whether uh, the crisis is changing the balance of power between the main actors. I have read, and you have read, that actually this crisis is the triumph of China and the end of the American empire. I should think, I should say, that for me it's the most counterfactual conclusion that you can draw. I don't see in any way how this crisis is, in a sense, undermining the pillars of the American power. And I don't see how China, which actually has been at the origin of the virus, which has, handi uh, which has handled the, the, the crisis in the usual way for a, a dictatorship, which means through lies, manipulation, and, and actually incarceration. I don't see why uh, China would, would come out of this crisis as a winner. I'm not going to say it's a loser, but I don't see why it would be a winner. And, uh, and on the American side, all the pillars of the American power, I'm not going to, go to make uh, this thing, you know them, are still there. The two countries, like uh, the European countries, are going to be severely hit by the economic crisis. But don't forget that China, after all, China is the industrial plant of, of the world. So China will be obviously hit by the crisis. And, and China needs a very, uh, needs a strong growth, considering that there are still 300 millions of Chinese living in an abject, uh, abject poverty. So, my conclusion in terms between China and the US would be, frankly, I don't see what has changed. It's true that there was a trend before the crisis, which is what I call the rebalancing of the international system. We are 
living an unnatural period where there were only one power, the United States, which after the collapse of the communist bloc, there was only one power. But we are looking at the history of the world, it's not natural. So in a sense, we, we have seen for at least a decade, a rebalancing of the international system, not only with, uh, with China, rising of China, but also India, and in a sense, a sort of coming back of Russia. So that's a reality, and it's not going to, it's not going to change, and the US will remain for the coming decade, will remain the main power in the world. You may conclude uh, to a weakening of, of, the, of the United States uh, by the fact simply that the United States is not, it's not using anymore its power. Uh, it's, it's very striking that uh, the US basically facing this virus crisis, the US doesn't care about the world. Basically, the President Trump is America first, means America alone, we are caring about what is happening in the US and we don't consider that what is happening abroad has any consequence but negative on what is happening in the US. So there is no leadership of America in this crisis. But again, it's not the consequence of, of a weak America. It's, it's a deliberate political decision of an American administration and it could have been different. Second element, uh, if uh, the main actors are changing their policy uh, because, of the, because of the crisis. If you look at, uh, and again, with the caveat of this economic recession uh, that, uh, which will have geopolitical consequences, but we really don't know how it will uh, uh, hit our, uh, our societies. Basically, if you look at, um, what was the world before uh, the coronavirus? I'm sure that you can remember, actually, even if it's, it's, it's sound, it looks very far away. Uh, you, you saw that there were very strong underlying trends in our societies everywhere. Uh, trends which actually led to the election of Trump, which led to the, uh, the victory of Brexit uh, and to the yellow vest in France and, and so on. Uh, what it's what we call more or less the, the populist uh, uh, rage, the populist uh, pressure, and what were the, the main elements of, 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 of populism. Uh, first, it was protectionism. You know, that was something very strong. It, in a sense, it may be the summary of Trump's policy, but everywhere there was uh, a call for protectionism uh, because uh, or, or it was said that uh, globalism, free trade actually had led to uh, the misery of, uh, especially in the, in the, for, in the old industrial, industrialized regions uh, of the Western world. So protectionism was there, was there a call for protectionism. Secondly, uh, you had uh, really nationalism, you know, really the, about the question of identity, uh, what does it mean to be American, what does it mean to be French, to be really British, uh, so you had nationalism was, was, was back. Multilateralism was criticized. You know, that was what the far right was saying. We are the, global, the globalist against the localist. So multilateralism was criticized, not only by the, by, by the, only by the, the far right, but also on the left. And it was really, and the European Union was especially uh, the target of the criticisms coming from the far right and, uh, and the far left. You, are, you know, you had all this uh, language about the borders, about identity against, uh, against immigration. And unfortunately, when I look at all these trends uh, that I have summarized very quickly, uh, in a sense, uh, the virus, uh, what is happening today, is amplifying all these trends. First, protectionism. You know, you hear everywhere people say we are depending too much on the chain of supply uh, coming uh, with, uh, on, with China. Why our medicine and even in France, why our masks are made in China? And you hear even, um, in a sense, middle of the way politicians say we have to look at it. Uh, we have to really talking of bringing back a strategic, uh, strategic industries, strategic industries which in other words uh, means protectionism. Uh, I know that 
uh, there is, uh, uh, in French we say, there is far from the cup, from the lips to the cup. And uh, really, it's not tomorrow that industries will be repatriated from China, but it's obvious that there is a new argument about protectionism against free trade uh, in an atmospheric where free trade were, was already uh, criticized. Second element, multilateralism. Uh, to be frank, multilateralism is, as uh, there are reasons to uh, today to believe that the multilateral institutions have not been up to the task. Uh, of course, the World Health Organization, and again, right, rightly or wrongly, but the fact is that the organization is, is, is criticized. The European Union, of, uh, again, right or wrong, but a lot of people believe that the European Union has been unable to react quickly and to react enough. And yesterday there was the European Council, and once more, uh, we have had a traditional history between the northern country, the southern country. No decision has been taken. It's very likely that, as usual, the European Union will muddle through. But in a time of extreme tension like ours, uh, it's obvious that the conclusion will be or is that actually the European Union is not uh, uh, really has not shown its effectiveness, and that the reality has been that the nation states have been the protectors of the citizens. Every European country, like the US in a sense, have, has reacted on its own, closing its borders, forbidding the export of some equipment. So there is really the idea of the nation state is back and multilateral organizations are um, effective. You have also the return of the state. Uh, when you see what the state is doing, in a sense, nationalizing uh, the economy, uh, pouring hundreds of billions of, of euros. So suddenly people say, you see, uh, it's the end of the neoliberal moment, the state is back. And, and that was also uh, really uh, a claim of far right and far left in our political uh, systems, uh, say, you know, the state has to defend the national, uh, national uh, community. So when you look at all these, these trends, uh, when you look at the, the crisis, you see that uh, the virus, the crisis, you know, is amplifying uh, these, uh, these trends. Uh, so it's, and I was forgetting also, it, it may sound a bit anecdotal, but it's not so much because uh, the way uh, Donald Trump is playing on it is very shrewd, as usual. It's the, it's the attacks against the experts, that's in the elite you know, at the core of the populist rebellion, you have the idea that the elites are betraying and the experts uh, are, are totally unable uh, to respond to the real challenges of our times. And you see that it's very present in the debate and we saw it yesterday, yesterday night. And it would be a big mistake to take it as, as, as a joke. Actually, it's a deliberate strategy of Donald Trump, who is certainly for me the shrewdest politician of our times who perfectly understand what is happening in our societies, where are the nerves, and who is putting the, 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 finger, uh, the finger on the nerves. So that's my, in a sense, my, 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 my conclusion. I think that, you know, people, they are, uh, I, I love idealists, you know, really, they have the right of being. They are saying the world uh, after won't be like the world before. I think they're right, but I think that the world after will be worse than the world before. Because the, all the worst trends that liberal democracies uh, were facing are going to be there the day after, if there is a day after, by the way, will be there and will be more powerful with governments, I should say, unavoidably weakened because they will be, they will be considered as responsible of the failure of the fight against virus, and certainly not of the successes, because in facing this crisis, you are never successful. It's always half empty, half full. The, the glass is always half empty, half full. And I'm ready to bet that a lot of voters will consider that uh, the, the glass is half empty, at least in France. Everything so, the elections of the 3rd of November, which are totally unpredictable. We don't know how many millions of people will be 
uh, unemployed. We don't know whether there will be uh, a, a new outburst of the, of the virus. We don't know what the voters will, will conclude of the, of the crisis, but this crisis will be, this election will be certainly more critical than ever uh, before, uh, uh, between, with a stark choice uh, between two types uh, in the sense of societies and two types also of foreign policy. Uh, and, and not only American foreign policy, because as you saw, uh, as I have said, uh, what we see, what we have now uh, in the coronavirus crisis is a crisis without American leadership. And, and you see what, what it does mean. It means simply no international, uh, no international cooperation. And so it means, of course, if Donald Trump will be reelected, it will be the world that we, are, we would face, a world of stark power politics uh, where uh, the Europeans, and it won't be easy, where the Europeans uh, will have to uh, learn not to be herbivores, but become, like everybody, carnivores. Thank you very much, and I'm ready to answer to all the questions. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, for this presentation. We already have several questions, so I'm just going to dive right in. Um, for all of those of you who are listening, please feel free to send more questions on the Q&A function of the Zoom or through Facebook comments. Um, so we have a lot of questions that are very connected to what you were talking about. Um, people are asking us whether you think that this crisis will cause more countries to become more isolationist, or is there an opportunity for greater global cooperation around key issues that affect us all, climate change, etc. Coming from Jennifer. Well, unfortunately, as I've said, uh, there is a logic behind the idea we have to, of cooperation. Uh, but uh, what I see right now uh, is first, the US don't care. Uh, you know, the, Ameri the, the United States now is chairing the G7. So uh, Trump could have used the G7 uh, for uh, cooperation. Uh, we should cooperate in officially in terms of looking for a vaccine, for instance, or, or even, you know, sharing equipments. Uh, it's totally a, a shame that uh, each bloc, in a sense, the US, the European Union, the, the China, is, is working on its own. And, and you see, because there is one leader, leader who is talking in terms of cooperation, which is Emmanuel Macron, uh, but is, France is unable uh, on its own uh, to boost uh, international uh, cooperation. For instance, you know, even Britain has refused for obvious ideological reasons to cooperate with the European Union, to show that Brexit was the right decision, so we are not going to work with the group that we are, we are living. So um, maybe I'm too pessimistic, but frankly, looking at uh, the trends, uh, things may change, and uh, the election of November the 3rd may change things, but I don't see right now a strong, I should say, a strong uh, um, appeal for international cooperation. Sadly. <laughs> um, similarly to this, there are a lot of questions that are sort of in line with this. So also, and you commented on this a little bit during your um, expose, but people are asking what the European Union needs to do to leverage the COVID-19 crisis and increase its geopolitical power. This is coming from Sofia Alsabag. Uh, to be frank, you know, really, uh, there was a, among the, um, the underlying trends uh, that I was referring to, there is one which was the crisis of the European Union. The European Union was facing the crisis. Brexit was obviously a, a major trauma, uh, but there was also uh, the underlying question about the future of the Eurozone. You know, the Eurozone is a monetary union without budgetary and fiscal union. And, and in a sense, it's very difficult. It, to the point of, wondering whether it is sustainable. And, and Europeans are still divided between the North and the South, uh, between really the North, who, which considers that uh, actually they shouldn't subsidize the pizza eaters of the South and, 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 and so on. That's the first uh, uh, really uh, crisis. And uh, uh, we have seen it 
in a very stark way uh, in the beginning of the coronavirus crisis. Uh, there were awful, awful declarations by the Dutch Prime Minister, uh, really leading to, a, uh, I think, a normal, a very accurate and very good reaction of the Portuguese Prime Minister. And yesterday, the, the summit, the European summit, actually led, in fact, to no major decision. And, you know, really, basically, it said, oh, it will be to the Commission to, to make proposals, which is a way of saying we have not uh, actually reached a conclusion. I don't think the European Union is going to break on that, but I think it will go muddled through the way it has done during the Greek crisis. Second point, there is absolutely no inclination uh, in the European public opinion to more integration. In a sense, uh, uh, President Macron, who is calling for, for it, is a bit St. John the Baptist in the dessert. Uh, he's alone because the public opinion, and I, I suspect including in France, is very, it's not very keen on, on, going, on going further. And, and I really, again, I, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I, I'm always, I remind you the Italian factor. You know, really, uh, when you look at the country, when you look at their GDP, uh, at the stagnation, the, this government, which frankly doesn't make any sense uh, between the center and this, the five-star party, uh, uh, basically a coalition which has only one uh, goal, which is to prevent the, the victory of the far right. Uh, you know, and in each Italian local election, uh, people say, oh, the far right has lost, but they lost maybe in the leftist region, but they got 12 points more. So, and what will happen if Salvini was the Italian prime minister? So, unfortunately, uh, again, <laughs> uh, you know, really, I, I hope that uh, there won't be too many suicides after this, uh, this session. Uh, but um, uh, again, on one side, you can be really, the Europeans so far have always concluded that it was better to keep the European Union uh, than to risk uh, a, a breakup. Uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel has always taken the right decision, usually too late and too, late and too little, but she has always taken the right decision. And you have seen recently that even if she doesn't cross the border, the, la the red line of uh, the, the common, uh, common debt for all the European countries, she has made some concessions uh, and uh, to, so 500 billion euros uh, will be uh, dispersed for, for uh, and and more could be uh, more could be uh, in the pipe. So unfortunately, I think that at the best, the European Union should be uh, a bit self-centered, looking at its own survival rather than being a real geopolitical uh, agent. Um. <laughs> Also, so you, you, you commented on the role of the WHO as well and how um, certain um, global governance organizations are slightly weakened. We have some questions uh, around that line as well. Um, so here's a question coming from Bessiana Kader. Uh, as a former ambassador of France to the UN, what is your analysis of how the UN intergovernmental bodies, Security Council and General Assembly are dealing with this global crisis. More generally, how relevant and how useful do you think the UN has proved to be tackling the crisis? So there is a lot of, uh, I should say, illusions about uh, around the United Nations. Uh, you have to remember that when the United Nations were created in 1945, it was with the memory of the, the League of Nations between the two world wars, where basically when a, a big power was criticized, or was attacked, uh, its only re way of reacting was to leave the organization. So you had uh, success, you know, Japan, Italy, Germany, and the Soviet Union actually left uh, uh, the, the League of Nations. The US never, uh, never joined. Uh, so that's the reason why uh, in 45, uh, out of realism, uh, we put, we put, they put, they gave a right of veto uh, to five permanent members. It was a way of saying, of giving the guarantee that the United Nations will not go against the, the, the major, the, the interest of the major powers. Second element, uh, you have to be realistic and all these organizations, uh, UN organizations, of course, 
are also depending on their shareholder, their major shareholders. So it has, it has always been the case that when you are a director general of an organization, you are more sensitive to the interest, to the suggestions, the ideas of, uh, of China or the United States than you are to the, the ideas of any other countries, any other countries. So that's the rule of the, that's the rule, that's the way the world has been, has always functioned and that the United Nations is uh, working. People forget, for instance, that during the Cold War, uh, the UN Security Council hardly met uh, because there was such an opposition between the, the US and the USSR that basically it was even impossible to have a meeting. So you really, uh, the UN in a sense is working since the collapse of the, uh, the Soviet Union. And it has been working uh, because there was only one power, the United States, and basically, let's be frank, uh, the United Nations was very close to the interest of the West. And if you look uh, still today uh, in the hierarchy of the United Nations, you see that there may be some Chinese, but there are a lot, a lot of Westerners. So what is happening is now, is basically that you have uh, uh, powers are back, big powers are back, like China, India. And so you see the also consequences, and Russia, and so the, you see the consequences in the, in the, in the United Nations. Uh, these powers are back and they are def defending their interests and they will defend their, their interests. And they have always been very keen on defending national sovereignty. Uh, because, uh, and so, so the result is that the United Nations right now is negotiating a resolution calling for a, a, a world ceasefire. Actually, for the last um, two weeks, the Chinese, the Americans, and the Russians working together are doing their best to empty uh, the text from, uh, from any significance. We are back to power politics, to rivalries between, uh, between powers, and, and which means that national interests are critical. At the same time, it's true, we can't go back, we can't go back to the 30s because there are also, uh, uh, I should say, national interests which are common to all the nations. Uh, we see it with, of course, with the climate change, but you, have, you can make a long list of topics uh, where actually uh, the management of the internet, uh, the ethics of the artificial intelligence, the crypto uh, currency. You can have a long list where basically even China or even the US on their own, they can do uh, uh, anything uh, effective. So the, the challenge will be uh, in, the coming, uh, in the coming years uh, to gather these people and to really to bring these people around the same table the way France did it with the COP21, uh, for, for the COP21. But I suspect that, as I was saying, uh, the European European countries by themselves, uh, they can't do it by themselves. So it, it depends also a lot on the United States. You know, really, if the United States wants to play the same game like China and Russia, very clearly, they won't be uh, multilateral solutions to the problem of the world. So again, uh, a, a lot will depend on, on what is happening in this country in 2020 or 2024. Thank you. Um, to, to bounce right off of that, we have a question from Ronald Goodman, who is commenting on the United States election and he's saying you were one of the very European leaders to foresee the shrewdness of Trump. How do you think Biden will fare against him? <laughs> My God, I, I really, if something, uh, uh, something is, is sure is that uh, as I've said, the elections of November are unpredictable, totally unpredictable. They were difficult to predict before, but now nobody knows. Nobody knows where, uh, where we, we are on November the 3rd, whether there will be uh, 5 million, 10 million, or 25 million of unemployed people in the US. And also in this very strange uh, uh, crisis uh, where fundamental questions are, are asked, whether the voters, uh, in a sense, will stone uh, the president as the scapegoat of the existential crisis, or whether in a, more, in a less 
I should say, a less uh, mystical way, uh, then we say, oh, he did his best. You know, I think it's a question that Trump is certainly asking during, uh, uh, you know, at night, but I think it's a question which is also for Boris Johnson, Emmanuel Macron, and, and others. You know, really, uh, what will be the rational and irrational decision, uh, judgment of, uh, of, of the voters? On John, Joe Biden, the poor Joe Biden, really campaigning without co a campaign, it's not easy. And, and campaigning from his living room is, is not the most convincing way of, 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 of campaigning, but obviously he doesn't have a choice. Uh, obviously he's campaigning on the idea of uh, anybody but Trump. So we see uh, Trump has been elected by a few thousand votes. A uh, few thousand may go the other way. Uh, and as I've said, there are so many uncertainties hovering uh, over the, 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 the campaign that I don't know. Uh, maybe to look a little bit at a French American sort of perspective, people are asking if you would mind commenting on how you feel that France, the differences and the similarities that you've noticed between France and the US's response to the crisis. And also, someone is asking if you're willing to comment um, on the way you think that President Emmanuel Macron has handled the crisis. Um, in a sense, uh, the, U the US and France are, are, are not that far away uh, uh, facing the crisis, you know, really, uh, even the figures, you know, really, if you look at where the Americans are now, uh, basically, you divide by its 50,000 uh, fatalities, it means uh, if you divide by five, it means the US will be uh, with the same population in France at 10,000, the French are at 20,000. Uh, you can argue but that the Americans are, in a sense, are a bit, uh, there is a delay after, after Europe. Uh, so I, frankly, I'm, I don't know why. I don't know why, actually, uh, the, um, the, the Europeans are convinced that the Americans it's a disaster. I don't know, really, compared to the, to the, to the to Europeans. You know that Europeans have a sense of superiority towards the, the Americans. I, I, I don't know why, but it has, been, it has been the case. You have a federal state. Uh, you have a very centralized France. And to be frank, neither uh, system, centralization, or federalism uh, is, is, is reacting in a very convincing way. Uh, you know, we are uh, on both sides of the Atlantic looking for masks or, uh, or also actually uh, looking for, for testing. And we have the same question about how we are going to, uh, to, to put an end to the lockdown. Uh, so, no, I, I don't see a, a major, major difference. I don't see success there and, and failure here or, 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 or the opposite. Uh, we have all been surprised by, by the, the, the virus. New York is a very good example. I think the problem of New York, the, the, really, New York uh, has as many victims than France, uh, with a population which, which is uh, even taking the, the great, the, or the city, which is, the, I think, something like the third of the population of France. In a sense, New York is a bit like Milano uh, in Italy. Obviously, in New York, uh, people have not have underestimated the virus, uh, the way the virus was already in the city, and it has led to this, uh, let's call it this, uh, this disaster. So the same questions, the same hesitation, we had have, we have even the same quarrel about the, the chloroquine, uh, you know, the, in the same terms, uh, even in political, uh, under the, the same political lines. Uh, so f I should say that for me, it's the similarities which are much more important uh, when, facing, uh, when facing this crisis. Thank you. Um, there are many questions, but we don't have much time left, so we're gonna wrap it up with one last question. Um, although your vision of the global future and impact of COVID-19 crisis is rather pessimistic, is there one aspect of this future that might bring hope and positive change to the world? Um, this question is from Malaburge. I'm sure it's an American who has asked this question. You know, the <laughs> Americans are, are optimistic and they can't accept a sort of pessimistic conclusion. Um, 
<laughs> no, first, I really, to go into the pessimistic sides, I think I have been very uh, Western in my, uh, in my assessment. You have also to think that, and here it's the big question mark, what is going to happen in Africa? Uh, what is going to happen, you know, really in Lagos, in Nigeria, where there are 20 million of inhabitants? What is going to happen in Cairo? Uh, what is going to happen in the Muslim world where they are entering uh, the Ramadan? You know, uh, so what does it mean for Pakistan or for, for Indonesia? So that's really something, uh, something very big considering the, the sanitary situation in this, uh, in this country. No, I think we, you can take the, uh, uh, the opposite stance that I took uh, really by saying uh, the danger is identified. Uh, you perfectly see, you see what is, uh, what we can go, uh, what we, where we can go, what we are going down the road, uh, as I've said, to power politics. Uh, but if you really, uh, power politics, it's something also which is something coming from another age. And I think there are a lot of young uh, people in America, but also in Europe, uh, who simply don't want to come back to, the, to these old stories. Uh, these old stories may come back, but we are still in, a, we are still in the antechamber ante of hell. So uh, the young French uh, don't hate or don't uh, uh, fear the young Germans. The young Germans don't fear and don't hate the young French, and so on. Uh, and the, French, the young French, the young Germans are sharing the same concerns for um, uh, environment and so on. So I guess it's, uh, if I were, my, my optimism, if I could be optimistic, would be uh, by betting on the young, on the youth. You know, really betting on the youth, really seeing what is going to happen, what, what may happen, uh, and uh, saying simply no. And uh, our problem is to have a green deal, uh, and, and we know that it doesn't make sense to solve the, 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 the crisis to save the oceans uh, with America alone, or with France alone, or Europe alone. It doesn't make, it doesn't make any sense. We know also with the, the youth that if we don't unite with the young Europeans on the other side of the Atlantic, actually it will be the Chinese model which is going to win. And the Chinese model is an authoritarian, a polluting uh, uh, model. So again, uh, I send you back the question uh, by saying to you, uh, the young people, the youth, uh, it's your turn uh, to save the world. To be frank, my generation is not, <laughs> frankly, uh, uh, the, 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 what we are giving you is not that, that brilliant. So it's to, to you to save the world. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. With that big sense thank of you. responsibility, I'll turn this over to Mary Monique for a few final remarks. Thank you very much. Please, pleasure. Okay. Well, uh, I don't know if we, uh, Gerard, thank you, thank you. I don't know if we come out of all this thinking of uh, a great optimism or a great pessimism. You've given us a choice, a choice. but I like the idea that we are betting on the young. I really think that that's a very, very uplifting way of ending your geopolitical uh, talk. Thank you very much. And I want you to know that, um, uh, just to tell you something, we've been looking at the, the French Institute Alliance Francaise to, be, to give uh, online French courses. For years, we've been talking about that. For years, the universities have been talking about that. Um, and now, everybody's doing it. And I believe that you're right. People, the young people are now used to it, and we might not go back to the exact same way. So that's very good. I just want to tell, thank everybody who has been listening to you and has gotten a wonderful package of thoughts for the evening at the dinner. I hope that they all have a nice dinner tonight. I just want to say that we have a membership month next month in May with a great deal of exciting, uh, exciting programs in food, wine, and theater. And I just want everybody to just log on 
fiaf.com, see what we do. We have a Mathias uh, Dandois, who is a cyclist, who is amazing. We have uh, Jacques Attali coming, thinking, and I hope that you will, the two of you will meet when he is on the Zoom. And um, we have the mise en trente in English. Anyway, so much, so much to give, so much to enjoy. And so um, I just want to say also, please give a donation if you feel that Tiaf is doing a job that you enjoy. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.